Hi, welcome to Bewilder Beasts. I'm your host, Melissa McKee McGrath, and today on Bewilder Beasts, we are going to talk about a horse who could do math and an animal who has square poop. Ew. Let's go. So today, I want you to think about horses you know. Maybe horses you've read about or maybe have studied. There are a couple horses in history who have been reported to be able to do math. And one was a horse named Clever Hans. And if you've ever taken an introduction to psychology class, you might have even heard of him. And while that was the horse I had intended to discuss, my friend Anne had brought to my attention a different mathematically inclined equine. This story seems much more relevant, and honestly, in these times, I feel this story of this horse, beautiful Jim Key was his name, he has a lot more that we can take away for today, over 120 years later. But first... Wombats are muscular, stubby-legged Australian marsupials who are bigger than I think you thought. They're between 44 and 75 pounds. So that's between a first grader and a fifth grader. They also have square poop. Ugh. Ew. Does that mean they have a square butt? No. The secret is how their intestines stretch during digestion. So when a wombat eats food, it goes through the body and into the intestines, just like us when we eat a sandwich. But our intestines are pretty stretchy and uniform, the same throughout. And that's like most other animals with an anus. Ugh. Ew. I know, I know, I just said anus. That's where the poop comes out. Okay, well, that makes our poop and most other poop-creating animals have rounder cylindrical poo. I did not know this until I was researching this today. But wombats have two ridges in their digestive tract, and we don't have that. And their intestines are not as uniform. So some parts of the intestines are stretchier than others and some are more rigid. Plus, wombats live in an area where they have to squeeze out every last drop of water from their food. The intestines squeeze the water out and they put it back into their body while the rest of the poop, which is much drier than ours, comes out like a cube, like a building block. Is this a function of evolution? Does God or whoever have a really good sense of humor? But the other cool thing about wombats, they have a pouch like kangaroos and other marsupials, but unlike other marsupials, they have a backward facing pouch. Why might this be? Well, wombats put their babies in the pouch, but they also dig elaborate tunnels with their teeth and their forelegs. If the pouch was going the traditional way, dirt would get into the pouch and hurt or even bury the babies. But by having a backwards facing pouch, mom can still work and raise her young at the same time. Goals, wombats. Goals. Okay, so this is the story of a sickly horse named Beautiful Jim Key who opened the doors for a former slave. But first we're going to talk about William Key. Slaves were often given the last names of their master, so when William was born in 1833 in Tennessee, given the surname Key after his master, John Key. John Key died when little William was only five years old. His family was willed to John W. Key. Our history has a lot of blemishes that we need to atone for, and this part of history is one of them. Sending people to live with other people because they are your property is an unforgivable sin on our history. But it turns out that little William was a great help to John's family. John Key's father was disabled and not well. But if William was around, the family remarked at how calm the elder Key was. So William was given special attention. Unlike most slaves at the time, William was taught how to read and write so he could help Mr. Key stay calm. As William was taking over the watch the old man duty that John's wife Martha did not want to do, she decided to teach William what was referred to at the time as gentlemanly skills. These included education, etiquette, and presentation, which no doubt served as a wonderful foundation for William's adult life. Little William didn't just have a calming effect on old men. He was a natural around horses. Can you picture a second grade child just left alone in a pasture to train horses in the 1800s? 
<laughs> well, actually, yes, I can. But that's effectively what happened to young William. He was so good at seemingly communicating with these 2,000-pound animals as young as the age of five that he was given the monumental responsibility of training all of the horses at the farm. When horses got sick, and because he was afforded the opportunity to read, he was able to read veterinary texts, and he started making and creating his own remedies for these animals on the farm. He was saving animals before medicine was really a thing. And you gotta keep in mind, this was in a time where cocaine was used for everything, including toothaches, muscle aches, Ow! hysteria, ah! impotence, ah! and anxiety. It was also promoted in this year's catalog, no doubt next to the washing machines and discount jeans of the day. So when John Key's sons went to fight in the Civil War, it said that William followed suit to protect them. Now, I have a lot of feelings about this, as I cannot picture being a slave in the 1800s and deciding on my own that I want to save my master's adult kids in a war that is being fought for my freedom. And history textbooks are written by white people like me, so I do caution to take some of this available history with a large grain of salt. Anyway, after the Civil War, William Key was suddenly considered a free slave. He could have bounced, left, started anew, but this was all he knew. And this was all a lot of slaves knew at the time. William was treated by all accounts much better than most. The Keys lost everything after the Civil War, but William, who had a stash of money saved up, did what I consider to be the unimaginable. He paid for John W. Key's two adult sons to attend Harvard University. You know, Harvard one of the most prestigious universities in the world. And when he was asked, why would you do this? He was quoted by saying, well, I was one of the fortunate men who had a kind master. Not only that, but after the war, he also paid off the mortgage on his dead master's property. And he continued to help support the young keys for the rest of their lives. How did he do it? Well, at first he paid the mortgage by making keystone liniment for animals and human use. Plus, gambling winnings, because he really did clean house in the war. He was gambling in the trenches, and he twice got out of being hanged by playing and winning poker games. He was able to afford all of this, paying for Harvard for two adult men, paying for a mortgage on a house that he was a slave in. But he wasn't done yet. He bought a veterinary office to help people with their horses. He truly believed that he was able to help these animals even though he had no education. The townsfolk knew William, and they started calling him Dr. William Key. Remember, medicine at the time was literally just winging it, often with heroin, cocaine, electric shock. But luckily, it was before lobotomies were used to treat over-emotional women in the 30s. So maybe Dr. Key was just in that sweet spot of medical history. He wasn't just helping horses, though. Dr. Key was known as a doctor for the people, and he practiced dentistry and dedicated his days to horses, people, and doing everything he could to provide care to former slaves. He then decided to travel a bit, get his patent and medication out there to sell to bigger masses, which again, in the South, even after slavery was essentially killed, Americans found new ways to keep black people submissive. There were laws written at the time that said separate but equal. Separate but equal is never equal. Despite all of what William Key has done for his masters, for their kids, for horses, for people, the South was not taking too kindly to a black man traveling alone. He couldn't get into a lot of places because he was black. Free wasn't free. It was on a trip where he stopped in Tupelo, Mississippi, when William saw a badly abused horse by the name of Loretta. He used his medicine and his skills to heal her, and then he bred her. And this is where everything changes for Dr. William Key, and I would argue a great moment in black history and for animal welfare. Loretta the horse foaled a horse so sick and unable to move properly that William wrote this horse off completely. He even named it after the town drunk, Jim, because they had the same wobble to their walk. But this horse, a horse who learned on his own how to open gates, open drawers to get his own apples, and was spectacularly trainable. But he was also kind of a pain in the butt. 
After his mom died, Jim the horse would scream, and he refused to be separated from William Key. He caused such a ruckus that the good doctor just brought the baby horse to live in his house, where Jim the horse lived as a human for essentially a year. But as horses do, he outgrew the house and was put back into the stables, and Dr. Key ended up moving out to the barn. These two were never separated again until after death. <laughs> For seven years, Jim was trained every day to do a series of tricks, tasks, and sensational for what passed at the time as magic. Because how else could people in the late 1800s explain how a horse could do math and spell, make change, take change, and pull it out of a cup of water without spilling a drop? This horse could write letters, and he could even write his own name on a chalkboard. This horse could pick out playing cards by name alone show me the queen of hearts and he could do it. This horse could play a hand organ. Hoof organ? Anyway, so many things. And as there was no internet, no podcast, no social media, there were no ads for me undies or Kickstarter to get interesting projects in front of the eyes of prospective buyers. The shopping channels and infomercials were another 86 plus years down the road. Basically, Old tiny inventions and what would have been memes were demonstrated and exhibited at fairs and exhibitions. Although Beautiful Jim was impressive and so cool to watch, they were limited not just by having no cars or no internet, but by Dr. Key's race. No matter how eloquent he was or how talented, because William Key was a black man in the 1800s, he was only allowed to participate in selected competitions. William first exhibited Beautiful Jim Key in 1897 in Nashville as part of a Negro-only exhibition. A man named Albert Rogers, a wealthy officer of the American Humane Association, was stopped in his tracks. He saw firsthand the work that William Key and Jim did together. When he found out that William only trained his animals, including Beautiful Jim, with positive reinforcement and rewards, Albert Rogers was floored. Rogers, a white man, offered to take William and Jim around the country to show what kindness can do in working with animals, something that people, including my profession, are still working incredibly hard at today, over 120 years later. Albert also paid William Key a large sum of money and promised that Jim would never be separated from Key as long as either lived. A promise that was kept. Do you know who else happened to be in the audience at that first presentation? You know, just a guy named William McKinley. Oh, I'm sorry, I read that wrong. That was President William McKinley. The President of the United States just watched a self-taught former slave perform incredible tricks on stage with his horse. President McKinley offered high praise for both the horse and the training methodology. He went on to say, This is the most astonishing and entertaining exhibition I have ever witnessed. He then said it was an example of what kindness and patience can accomplish. President McKinley, I agree. William Key agreed to go with Albert Rogers to tour the United States with Jim. In 1897, beautiful Jim Key amazed viewers and the New York City press and quickly became a celebrity. Other exhibitions that Jim was able to go to included the World's Fair. World's fairs at the time were three to six month exhibition fairs where people could just go and see the newest things. Things you would recognize today, like the Ferris wheel was debuted in 1893 and almost a hundred years later, Cherry Coke. We also saw the X-ray machine, the Ford Mustang. Countries had their own space at these fairs. So at the Paris World's Fair, there was a pavilion tent for the United States, which was segregated. They had a black pavilion in the United States tent for just black exhibitors. Separate but equal is never equal. So when I say this horse was the biggest draw imaginable at the time, he was bigger than the Ferris wheel. Dr. Key was able to sell out Madison Square Garden for a sickly horse who could do math. That is impressive. When Dr. Key traveled along with beautiful Jim, the horse traveled in private train cars drank purified water, and ate hay that was fit for a star of his caliber. None of these things would have been afforded quite so easily to his owner if it were not for the horse. Jim traveled with Dr. Key, two grooms, a veterinarian, and Monk, a stray dog turned horse bodyguard and friend. 
Monk the dog liked to stand on the horse's back, and they would perform tricks together. And for nine years, Key, Rogers, Beautiful Jim, they toured major cities east of the Rocky Mountains. Children received Jim Key Band of Mercy cards by pledging to be kind to animals. Over two million people before the internet were able to take this pledge. Local humane societies received sizable shares of admission sales after seeing Jim. In 1906, beautiful Jim Key and William Key retired to Shelbyville, Tennessee, where Key lived comfortably until his death in 1909. Dr. William Key, a former slave who vowed never to use a whip to train his horse, was able to get over 2 million children before the internet to pledge to always be kind to animals. And that is the story I think we should all be teaching kids in 2020. I have a friend who loves cats. Every time she used to come over to visit in the before times, she would just make a beeline for my kitty, but my cat would consistently bite her and only her. My cat is social, but not with this particular friend, but my friend loves cats. Why would my cat bite this woman who loves cats? That same cat would consistently go to my other friend who is not into animals at all. I hear from people all the time who are allergic to cats and say that they seem to be the ones in the room that cats always hone in on, much to their chagrin. Why is that? Are cats just playing a trick? Look, I can make the human sneeze. Or are cats really just the vindictive little jerks that some people think they are? When humans don't care for cats, they try to avoid looking at them and at the same time keep an eye on them. They want to make sure the cat isn't coming. Ah, darn, here it comes, rubbing on my leg, jumping in my lap. Oh, great. Now it's purring. Well, now let's look at this from the cat's perspective. To a cat, staring and invading personal space is basically translated to, Oh, you want to fight me? Polite cats look briefly and then quickly look away. So when you meet a cat you want to be friends with, note its location in the room and avert your eyes. When humans don't like cats, they're trying not to pet them. If the cat comes over, the person might just instinctively pet it once just to pacify the cat. Okay, I'm patting you, now you can go. And then hope, 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 hope that the cat goes away. But playing hard to get with a cat is how cats make friends. So if you want to be friends with a new cat, let the cat approach you. It will likely rub up against you and then admit you into the cat club for best friends. Contrast this from my first friend, the one who loved cats so much that she just walks up and goes straight to petting. For starters, if I did that to you, without knowing you at all, you would maybe be uncomfortable. Imagine a grown woman just walking up to you and rubbing your head without any other interaction first. That's not cool in any species. An animal's cuteness is not permission to say hi unasked. Consent, consent, consent. Additionally, when we humans like things, we tend to stare at them. But to cats, that just means potential territorial invasion, a threat. Plus, when we love something very much, we might just ignore body language signals saying back off, like tail twitches in the case of the cantankerous cat. And it's not the cat's fault she's cantankerous. I would probably bite someone too if they came into my personal space, stared at me, walking into my house, and then they touched me everywhere without even bringing me snacks. So if you love cats, look away and let them come to you. I don't know, pretend you're allergic. That will bring them right into your lap. So thanks again for joining me today on Bewilder Beasts. If there are topics that you would be interested in hearing about on this podcast, know of any cool historical animals who changed the world, animals who help humans, or wacky animals in the news, please send them in to bewilderbeastspod at gmail.com. Tweet at bewilderedpod, bewilderbeastpod on Facebook, and bewilderbeasts on Instagram. I am Melissa McHugh McGrath with Mutt Stuff Media. Now go get curious. 
I got today's information from NationalGeographic.com, Wikipedia on beautiful Jim Key, Horseforum.com, At the Fair, Archive.com, Mental Flasks, LOC.gov, a collection on African-American perspectives, rare books, and articles and essays of the time, Findagrave.com, The Tennessee Encyclopedia, Slate.com, CatBehaviorAssociates.com, and History.com on the most outrageous medical treatments in history. Links, as always, are in the description of today's episodes. Intro music is Tiptoe Out the Back by Dan Lebowitz, and interstitial music is by MK2. Don't forget to like, subscribe, review, and share with your curious friends. You know, all the things every other podcast tells you to do. Thanks for listening. <laughs>